Thank you, Peter. I'm um, very happy to be here and to have this chance to test these ideas on this audience. Uh, I'm writing a book on 21st century or contemporary, sort of an easier term to use, Irish poetry, and the book is not encyclopedic and it's not chronological, and, and I hope it's going to be somewhat random and quirky in its organization. And to get to the topic today of the dreamer on the train, I picked books off the shelf and was inspired, and one of the poems that inspired me you will hear read today by its author. Um, what I discovered in contemporary Irish poetry was a topos that I call the railroad reverie. Trains are ubiquitous in all kinds of literature. There are many train poems in many languages. Uh, there are poems that are situated on trains, and they take as their subject intimate conversations between strangers. Uh, some of them are about the view from the window. Uh, in some cases, the verse imitates the rhythm of the train's motion. And there are also quite a number of poems about train wrecks. Uh, but hitherto, no one to my knowledge has analyzed the reverie, the dreamy, passive, non-purposive state of mind described by the speaker of many train poems. This condition involves a surrender of agency, a suspension of concentration on chores or work. It's a kind of parenthesis or hiatus and an openness of the imagination really to anything, uh, to whatever happens on the train. Um, this surrender of agency, which is often a surrender to sleep or sleepiness, is produced, um, I think, in large part by the physical and material circumstances of the train ride. Um, many scientists have studied the fact that people tend to fall asleep on trains, and scientists, particularly in Switzerland, in the U.S., and I'm going to give you just a quick run-through of the scientific words they use. Um, don't ask me to explain them. But if you, I guess if you know Latin or Greek, you can figure them out. Um, but they, scientists relate the phenomenon of falling asleep on the train to the regular rocking motions of the train, the vibrations of the engine, and what they call the white noise. That's not the term I don't understand. I do understand white noise. The white noise of the sound. Um, here's the scientific language. The low frequencies entering the body stimulate the vestibular auditory system as well, I don't know why this makes me laugh, as well as the somatosensory system, and it is this multi-sensory nature of rail car vibration that is involved in inducing sleep. Um, they also say that the rocking motion synchronizes brain waves. Um, but these features, not in this language, fortunately, are mentioned in several of the poems that I'll be talking about. Another material feature of the train is, that is equally important is the window. Um, for the passenger on a train, there's a sharp boundary, most of the time, between exterior and interior. The window, whether open or closed, but most of the time these days closed, separates the traveler from the passing landscape, in fact, from the rest of the world. On an old-fashioned train divided into compartments or a couchette, um, what Von Gork calls the train's rampant privacy is even more intense. The notion of a closed private space in which a poem's speaker relaxes in a dreamy sleepiness is not a new topos. It recalls the Bauer or Hortus Conclusus of medieval Renaissance, Romantic, and Victorian poetry, an enclosed natural space that may be aesthetic, erotic, or holy, but whatever it is, it's spatially separated from everything outside it. And just to give you one example of these, probably the most famous, I'm going to read in a translation, not in Middle English, uh, the beginning of Piers Plowman, um, which, like many dream vision poems, begins with the description of such a place. And you have all the, all the quotations I'm going to read, you have on the sheets. But on a May morning on Malvern Hills, a marvel befell me a fairy, methought. I was weary with wandering and went me to rest under a broad bank by a brook's side. And as I lay and leaned over and looked into the waters, I fell into a sleep, for it sounded so merry. 
the warm weather and the noise of the waters, like the various motions and sounds of the train, have a soporific effect and put the, sleeper, put the speaker to sleep. The fairy element, the sense that something magic may be involved, is also a common feature, as in Langland says, fairy me thought, and even, I think, Keats's fairy lens forlorn. And this element is also present in some of the recent Irish poems I'll be discussing, poems by Michael Longley, Bernard O'Donohue, Elaine Nuhillanon, Gerald Daw, Vona Bork, Seamus Heaney, and Colette Rice. In these poems, the mechanical and architectural features of the train, the sound, the movement, the window, separate the traveler from all that's outside the coach. They create a provisional detachment from the world outside the train. And a quotation from the 19th century French historian Hippolyte Ten, which is quoted I haven't read Ippolite 10 other than this, to my knowledge, other than this quotation, but uh, the train theory man, Wolfgang Schivelbusch, in his 1979 classic, The Railway Journey, quotes this passage, and it, um, it's one of the few prose passages that um, fits what I found <coughs> in the poems, and that's also on your sheet, this quotation. Alone in the compartment... I have spent three of the sweetest hours I have experienced in a long time. I was alone in my carriage. The wheels rolled on indefatigably, with a uniform noise like that of a prolonged roaring note played on an organ. All mundane and social ideas faded from my mind. No longer did I see anything but the sun and the countryside in bloom, smiling all green and with the greenness so various and illuminated by that gentle rain of warm beams, beams that caressed it. This passage suggests that the material features of the train produce a different way of knowing, a mode that is a partial and mediated non-rational perception. So what I'm going to look at now is how this different way of knowing works in a bunch of contemporary Irish poems. And I'm going to do them, um, after I do uh, Michael Longley's poem, um, I'm going to do them in twosies. The poems will be um, paired. And Michael Longley's The Rabbit is a classic example of the topos. It's a magic, mysterious, fluid series of images and allusions is inspired and generated by the poet's sleep on the train whose rocking puts him to sleep periodically as he dozes and dreams of the rabbit. Uh, the poem is a jeu d'esprit, and Michael has very generously consented to read his poem for us, which is on the sheet. The rabbit. I close my eyes on a white horse pulling a plough in Poland, on a haystack built around a pole, and opened them when the young girl and her lover took out of a perforated cardboard shoebox a grey rabbit. An agreeable, shitty smell, turds like a broken rosary, the slow train rocking this dainty manger scene. So that I, with a priestly forefinger, tried to tickle the narrow brain space behind dewdrop eyes. And it bounced from her lap, and from her shoulder kept mouthing prunes and prisms, as if to warn that even with so little to say for itself, a silly rabbit could pick up like a scent trail my gynecological concept of the warren, with its entrances and innermost chamber, with a heroic survival in Warsaw's sewers of just one bunny saved as a pet for real, for its afterlife as hasn't pepper, with cloves and bay leaves, onions, enough! And so it would make its getaway when next I dozed, crossing the odour, somewhere in Silesia, Silesian lettuce, mmm, never to meet again. Or so I thought, until in Wooj, in the small hours, a fat, hilarious prostitute 
let that rabbit bob across her shoulders without tousling her hair down, and burrow under her chin and nuzzle her ear as though to pruning the groves of Blarney, or she walked unaware. Then in her cleavage it crouched as in a ploughed furrow, ears laid flat, pretending to be a stone, safe from stoat and fox. Thank you very much. Michael, and uh, Michael is not responsible for what I'm about to say. In fact, he doesn't even know what I'm about to say. So, <laughs> thank you very much. The sleepy, dreamy state of reverie begins the poem I closed my eyes on. The speaker closes off the world outside the window, also inside the carriage. When he opens his eyes, he sees the rabbit appearing from a box, the slow train rocking this dainty manger scene. The ride's clearly putting him to sleep. The rabbit makes its getaway when next I dozed, crossing the odor. The fact that the poem is one sentence, one very long sentence, also creates the impression that the poet's mind is freely associating and moving with little conscious control, little apparent conscious control, from one image or idea or allusion to the next, each connected to the subsequent one in a way different from the way it was connected to the previous one, all seemingly rabbit-related, but in constantly shifting interpretations of the original rabbit. The poem is also entirely playful in its mix of linguistic registers and allusions. Um, Michael Longley uses shitty as if it were not a rude word, just a rabbit word, and the turds look like a broken rosary. Um, Longley himself has a priestly forefinger and a gynecological concept of the Warren. He's thinking in such a rabbity way that the mention of Silesia makes him say, parenthetically, Silesian lettuce. Mmm. The mmm, which Michael did, I can't imitate the way Michael did it, suggests the poet notices the weirdness of his own free associations and the rabbitiness of them, but keeps right on going with them. The characterization of the fat, hilarious prostitute shows that the mix of registers continues. She isn't sordid or sexy, but another aspect of the wacky, dreamlike, fluid sequence of beings he encounters or imagines. The Irish songs, one is just a poem, both associated with women in rural Ireland, both traditional and somewhat sentimental, are very unlikely for a Polish rabbit to be crooning. The line of thought I've been tracing, really a flow of allusions, presents the rabbit as vulnerable and somewhat holy. The young girl and her lover with the rabbit in the cardboard shoebox are metaphorically a dainty manger scene. The Warren reminds Longley of Warsaw sewers where the Polish and Jewish underground resistance hid and fought the Nazis, most famously in 1944 during the Warsaw Uprising. But Longley keeps these allusions rabbit-related. He knows the places on the other side of the window through the rabbit, or his memory of the rabbit. The line, or the heroic survival in Warsaw sewer, seems to apply to the Jews before the next line tells us that it's just one bunny he's talking about. Beginning to give the recipe for Hassenpfeffer, Longley stops himself in mid-syntax with an anacoluthon, enough, as if to keep the rabbit alive, to prevent it from being cooked, and return to the rabbit's getaway, as he himself dozes on the train. To his surprise, he sees the rabbit again, now burrowing under the fat, hilarious prostitute's chin, nuzzling her ear, and then crouching in her cleavage. It crouched as in a plowed furrow, ears laid flat, pretending to be a stone safe from stoat and fox first in a manger, then associated with the Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto, finally most rabbit-like, it is safe from stoat and fox. In all these situations, it's protected in snug maternal spaces, the young girl keeping it in its perforated cardboard shoebox, the warren that is gynecological, the warren that is like the Warsaw sewers, and finally the space between the prostitute's breasts where the rabbit is safe from the natural enemies of a real rabbit. The rabbit is, of course, surreal, mediating between the poem's speaker and the places through which he travels. 
It ends in a kind of natural landscape, the plowed furrow of the woman's breast that evokes the original scene Longley fell asleep looking at on the train, a white horse pulling a plow in Poland. The whole magic, mysterious series of images and allusions is inspired and generated by the poet's sleep on the train, whose locking puts him to sleep, sleep periodically as he dozes and dreams of the rabbit. And now I'm going to my next section, in Bernard O'Donohue's The Rainmaker and Elaine Nehulanon's The Binding, a mysterious unnamed stranger, a man met on the train, never identified, functions as the rabbit does in Longley's poem, as a muse and a surreal and uncanny figure who seems to operate in another order of being, mediating between the poem speakers and the realm on the other side of the window. They know the world outside the train through this figure. And first I'm going to look at the Bernard O'Donoghue poem. In The Rainmaker, the speaker takes his seat on the train at crew alone, only half reading the paper. His attention is soon focused on a 70-ish man who gets on the train, pulls out of his coat a copy of the poems of Dafidak Gwillem in Welsh, and starts reading. I'm not going to read the whole poem, but just parts. His lips begin to move, his eyes never lift again. Uh, this man, the reader of Welsh poetry, is absorbed in the poems, uh, the most famous of which are erotic poems, and I can't pronounce their names in Welsh, so I will tell you uh, what these erotic poems are in English. Uh, one is a poem in praise of the penis, and the other, the rattle bag, it's a story of Coitus Interruptus. Uh, this man reading these poems gets off at the North Wales seaside resort, Colwyn Bay. And this exit from the train surprises the poet speaker, um, who thought the man was going to Bangor and was perhaps a member of the Celtic Studies Department at the university there. Um, but he wasn't. The man reading the famous medieval Welsh poet is not part of that professional world. Or so the poem implies. And this is the end of the middle paragraph there, he folds the book back inside his scarf and off he goes. Uh, the middle verse paragraph says, and then something seemingly magical transpires. And I, this is now the last verse paragraph. And at that moment, 4.30 p.m. on Friday, January the 13th, the bleared weather that effaced the long and horizontal English midlands gives way to reaching bird-filled shores where ringed plover vies with lapwing to catch your breath against the latening sun. The abrupt opening of that paragraph, and at that moment, 4.30 p.m., and the precision of the time named imply that what follows is surprising, immediate, and a result of the exit of the Welsh poetry reader. Somehow, at that moment, the moment the man gets off the train, um, he, when he stopped reading, and on a Friday the 13th, as the speaker makes sure we know, the weather changes. Suddenly, the dim, cloudy weather cleared, the view opened up, and birds were visible, two kinds of wading birds, stunningly seen against the lightening sun. The final verse paragraph suggests a post hoc ergo, pro ergo propter hoc relationship between the poetry readers leaving the train and the change in weather. Does he make the sun come out? Is the book of medieval Welsh poetry the rainmaker? And when the book is folded inside his scarf, the rain stops? The poem expresses the speaker's amazement, one that fades into a vision of the landscape without making clear how that moment is connected to the last action in the preceding verse paragraph, the putting away of the book, or why it's important. Yet nevertheless, the syntax grants it importance. Not reading occurs twice in the poem. Because the speaker is only half reading his paper, he's, atten he's attentive to the man who boards the train. His way of knowing is not rational or book-based, he's simply looking. The putting away of the Book of Welsh poetry forms part of a sequence of events that appears to lead to the change in the weather and thence to the opening up of the view. 
If the speaker had been more attentive to his paper, more than half reading, he wouldn't have noticed the man and he wouldn't have looked out the window to see the bleared weather give way to the birds, the shores, and the lightning sun. Uh, for whatever reason, he's given this vision. Peter, would you like a copy of these poems? We have some extra copies back there. Um, they're, they're going to get complicated. Okay. Now the next one. In Nihulanon's The Binding, a poem set on a train in Italy, the speaker's attention is drawn to a man who stands up and goes to look out the window at a stone house when the train stops. Uh, she says the house intrigues. It belongs here and yet holds something strange. The speaker asks the man about the house and the stumbling ruin behind it. She admires its plain, reticent outside. Reticent because it doesn't reveal anything about the house's identity. It withholds information that might explain why the house seems to hold something strange. When the poem speaker asks, do people live there now, the man's response is cryptic. And I'm now reading the end of the poem. Oh yes, he says. They have to stay. They have the bindery and the herd. All that is still going on. And as long as they stay there, nothing will change. You can see the big press for flattening the books in the shed. Or at least I can, because I know it is there. So who are they? The man answers as if referring to they provided a sufficient explanation and as if the bindery and the herd were facts the speaker already <clears throat> knew about. All that is still going on, he says, as if, of course, the speaker had prior knowledge of them. And again, nothing will change also implies some prior information about what it is that will not change. As he interprets the scene that is on the exterior of the train, the man is most mysterious when he refers to what his interlocutor can see. The final line makes it clear that she can't see because the big press for flattening the books is inside a shed. He can see it because he knows it's there. The more the man says, the more enigmatic he is. Presumably they keep a herd because the books are bound in goatskin or cowskin and are flattened in a shed. Like the rabbit and the reader of Welsh poetry, the man who can explain the business of the stone house is a surreal train muse who interacts with the poem speaker at a non-rational level. There's no comprehensible content to their interaction which is left unexplained. Just as the rabbit magically reappears and the man on the train from crew appears to be a minor weather god, this man on this train has an uncanny ability to see through walls um, and know from the outside at least how books are made in a house whose purpose is hidden to others. And now I'm going to go to my next section. Um, in which I'm going to talk about what Shivel Bush, who is the train theory guy, calls, um, talks about the way velocity dissolves the foreground of vision on a train. And what you just see is what he calls panoramic perception, uh, the, the view moving past very quickly. Um, and in some train poems, the encounter with a swiftly moving landscape constitutes the central experience. There's a lot of these, and I'm only going to do two. The view is mediated by its distance from the speaker, whose way of knowing, knowing it is determined by the continuous disappearance of all its features. So in the poems by Gerald Daw and von Gort, the passing scene registers in a sleepy way as it does at the beginning of Longley's rabbit poem. The passiveness appears in a syntax, in a list or series of noun phrases that dominate and give agency to the components of the landscape. Um, Jerry Daw's poem, Lawn's Place, is a longer poem, and I'm just quoting the train part of it. And he, you wouldn't know this from the poem, but he told me that it was about a ride from Slovakia to Hungary. Um, so, so far, none of these rides are in Ireland. We'll get to some Irish rides, but they're all in foreign places. Um, and so this is, uh, I think, Jerry Daw's Railroad Reverie, and I'm going to be quoting, the, reading the part that you have on your sheet. And I fall back to sleep, this time in the couchette, listening to the wheels that brace and tack to miles and miles of railway track. At one station, its long name in black and white, 
the row of lorries parked in a yellowish light from the waiting room. The deadpan voice announces where we are and where we are going next as we arrive and depart the all-night factories, the cubist blocks of flats, the shapes of installations in the darkness, snowy embankments, sidings, cranes, sheds, and then nothing again. The wheels at my head, the door double locked. The countryside flees and I wake with a jolt. The passing scene is minimally interpreted. The speaker notes the visual yellowish light, snowing embankments, and auditory, listening to the wheels brace and tack, the deadpan voice. Um, all these are special effects, and his body responds to the motions of the wheels on the track and the jolt when the train stops. And what he observes is similar to the Ippolite 10 prose description I read you. The wheels rolled on indefatigably with a uniform noise like that of a prolonged roaring note, all mundane and social ideas faded from my mind. The slow pace and the syntactic parallel suggest the speaker is almost hypnotized through the, uh, through, by the movement through different landscapes. When he sees the station's long name in black and white, he doesn't read the name, he just notices it visually. It's long and it's in black and white. Um, the poem then ends with um, two italicized phrases. Are you still there? Is the sun still out? Which suggests that something has happened outside of the reverie. Either someone speaks to him or he speaks to someone else. But finally, a human interaction takes place outside this semi-hypnotic experience and he has to react, interact more rationally with the world again. Um, and now I'm going to talk about the Volna Gork poem in which there's a similar phenomenon. Um, this is a very obscure poem, and I had to read it many, many times to understand it. Um, but it still is, I believe, a railroad reverie. But you'll see what you think. Um, this is a poem called The Galway Train. Um, and in this one, as the speaker encounters the view from the train window, she, implies, she applies its characteristics to her emotional life, um, but with reticence. But again, it's the swift motion of the train especially that offers her a meaning. As the poem begins, Gork embeds two sentences that sound direct and emotional in a syntactic maze um, made up of details from the landscape. And I will read first the beginning of this, the Galway train. From it, it's possible, possibly, to translate a shadow's down payment on the side of a hill to a blatant future where one could admit I was in love, or I was younger then, to be nothing more or less credible than the throb of ragwort, excitable windows, a sincere line of ruins by the road. The two emotional statements the poem suggests are like the passing scene viewed from the train. Everything disappears into the past. Its reality as a view is temporary. To be nothing more or less credible than implies that the statements will have equal reality as, that is, they'll be impermanent in the clear, obvious future, like all the parts of the landscape seen and then immediately no longer seen as the train moves on. In the blatant future, when things are undisguised, open, clear, and obvious, it may be possible to admit that these emotional phrases, the phrases, not necessarily the emotions, are nothing more or less credible than elements in the landscape that the train is passing. They will have had actuality for a moment. And I'm going to read the end of the poem. I think that what I make of it is rampant privacy, Quirk continues, a way of extending what I see to be true past this specific urgency, this journey <coughs> slipping out like twine of a knot that does not take two for a finish, the kind of promise a few buttercups can make. In the privacy afforded by her journey, she sees how the train's movement creates an analogy for the way emotions may diminish in power when they're past the specific urgency of the present. Again, this is really difficult poetry, but I think that's, uh, that's what's going on here. I think it actually has a very sort of emotional heart to it, and I think it is a matter of emotions disappearing in the past the way the view does. Like twine, the journey moves from a knot something that can't be undone 
not in the past, which doesn't have recourse to the promise of something beautiful, lovely, and true, like the field of buttercups. Whatever kind of finish the knot takes to, it's not like that of the flowers. In her oblique way, Gork presents the train with its rampant privacy as a site for expressing emotions and letting them pass through her. She's non-purposive, opening her mind to the hill, the rowan trees, and the field of buttercups. The landscape as viewed from the Galway train offers the possibility of understanding that her urgent concerns in the present moment, I was in love or I was younger then, may be less urgent in the blatant future. And now I'm going to do my final section, which is about two, um, by two Northern Irish poets, and it's a very different kind of reverie. Uh, the poems I've talked about up to this moment situate their railroad reveries in the interior of a train, a compartment, or a couchette by a window. And as you will notice, the rest of the train doesn't feature in the reverie, except insofar as its sounds and motions are mechanically transmitted to the passenger's body. The poems emphasize the intimacy of a closed space. In two poems by northern poets, that intimacy is disturbed. There's an intrusion into the coach. The railroad section of Seamus Heaney's Flight Path and Colette Bryce's poem, The Quiet Coach, both hint at a reverie and show that it can't be maintained. The dreamy train experience is conspicuously manqué. It's a reverie interrupted. Um, and so now I'm going to read just the relevant section of Heaney's Flight Path. And I, there's a section that you have in brackets on your page, and I'm not going to read that. I put it there so you would know what's there, but you're going to have to skip over that. So um, I'll begin this part now. The following, for the record, in the light of everything before and since, one bright May morning. Notice, by the way, that's the same as Langland, who's... who's Space also begins on a May morning. One bright May morning, 1979, just off the Red Eye, special from New York. I'm on the train for Belfast. Plain, simple exhilaration at being back. The sea at Scaries, the nuptial hawthorn bloom, the trip north taking sweet hold like a chain on every bodily sprocket. Enter then as if he were some film noir border guard. Enter this one I'd last met in a dream, more grim-faced now than in the dream itself. And I'm skipping the next part. So he enters and sits down opposite and goes for me head on. When, for fuck's sake, are you going to write something for us? If I do write something, whatever it is, I'll be writing for myself. And that was that, or words to that effect. The grim-faced man who spoke to Heaney on the train was in reality Danny Morrison, Sinn Féin's publicity person, and he objected to Heaney's account of this episode in Stepping Stones, the book of interviews that Heaney did with Dennis O'Driscoll. And this is what Heaney says about that time on the train there. The account of what went on in the train is as it happened, yes. I make the speaker a bit more aggressive than he was at the time, but the presumption of entitlement on his part, which was the main and amazing aspect of that meeting, is rendered faithfully. It was all done pretty discreetly, actually. My interlocutor was the Sinn Féin spokesman Danny Morrison, whom I didn't particularly know at the time. He came down from his place in the carriage and sat into the seat in front of me for maybe eight or ten minutes. I didn't feel menaced. It was a straightforward, face-to-face -face test of will or steadiness. I simply rebelled at being commanded. If anybody was going to pull rank, it wasn't going to be a party spokesman. This was in pre-hunger strike times during the dirty protests by Republican prisoners in the h blocks. The whole business was weighing on me greatly already, and I had toyed with the idea of dedicating the Ugolino translation to the prisoners. But our friend's intervention put paid to any such gesture. After that, I wouldn't give and wasn't so much free to refuse as unfree to accept. 
Morrison himself objected to this version of their meeting. He gives his own, so you have three versions of it. You have the poem, you have Heaney in conversation with Dennis O'Driscoll, and you have Morrison's own version, because, as he says, the actual encounter was very polite and friendly, and they shook hands at the end. Morrison did more than pressure Heaney to write a particular kind of poem. He prevented Heaney from having a railroad reverie. Heaney was clearly just about on that, at that point, on the bright May morning with exhilaration <coughs> at being back, the sea at Scaries, the nuptial hawthorn bloom, the trip north taking sweet hold like a chain on every bodily sprocket. The image of the bodily sprockets that the trip north takes <coughs> sweet hold on suggests the passivity of the body moved by the train. It may even have been suggested by the forward movement of the train's wheels. The hold is sweet because the traveler feels such pleasure in his restful position as the beautiful view whizzes by. He feels as Hippolyte Ten did. All mundane and social ideas faded from my mind. No longer did I see anything but the sun and the countryside in bloom, smiling. But like the, but like the person on business from Porlock, Morrison comes along and ruins the poem Heaney may have been about to be inspired to write, and the social ideas return. Now I'm going to do another northern poem, Colette Bryce's poem, The Quiet Coach, uh, which she published in her 2014 volume, The Whole and Rain Dome Universe. And here, the reverie that seems to be possible is prevented by a more ghostly manifestation of the troubles. Bryce, born in 1970, grew up in Derry, and the troubles remain with her even in the peaceful enclosed space of a quiet coach in with which her mother makes a monetary appearance. And I'm going to read this poem to you. This is the whole poem. Look, three loops from the silver locks of my predecessor whose journey southwards earlier today was a textbook reversal of my own. In the weirder logic of a poem, the woman is my mother, hurtling ever backwards through unseasonable snow. She is steadily unsolving my every man crossword, reinstating each white space as if in the wintry landscape of her brain. On arrival, all solutions are undone. I bow my head to the questions. Because the coach is quiet, Bryce's speaker is undisturbed by any train distraction. She doesn't mention other passengers and there's a sense of solitude. The silver hairs are those of her predecessor, not just in the train, but in the family, her mother, the one who preceded her. If her predecessor was going south earlier today, then we can infer that Bryce is going north, though she doesn't say on what train. As she goes north, her mother is hurtling ever backwards. And as her mother is moving through the snow, she is in a spooky, creepy way adding white spaces to the crossword puzzle Bryce is doing. There's a kind of logic to that because if the train is reenacting her mother's journey earlier, then the letters wouldn't be in the little boxes. But there's more going on. In a recent interview, Bryce said, and you have this quotation on your sheet, I come from a culture where the written word is simultaneously revered and feared. My mother used to say, put nothing in writing, which seems quite funny now in terms of my inheritance as a writer. There's a cultural sense that writing is evidence that might be held against you. In The Quiet Coach, the mother predecessor is magically unwriting her daughter's letters, reinstating each white space. Bryce's mother was actually a primary school teacher with a specialty in handwriting, and so she is an authority on writing. At the end, her mother exerts a backward pull to a snowy white place, undoing Bryce's writing. When the train arrives at the station, all solutions are undone. The solutions to the crossword puzzle and to any more existential puzzle Bryce thought she had figured out. The mother's power over writing prevents the poet from indulging in the harmless play of a crossword puzzle. Haunted by the troubles, the mother in silver ghostly form haunts her daughter on the train, disturbs her journey, and unsolves her solution. The mother also unsolves the poem's rhyme scheme until the last triplet, the rhymes are quietly there, as is appropriate for a quiet coach. Locks and book, 
mother and ever, and the vowel lines of reinstating space and landscape. In the final lines, solutions and questions form the merest of rhymes. Like the noir Danny Morrison, the mother with her sinister whiteness brings the troubles into the privacy of the train and unsettles the traveler. Now I'm going to conclude. Uh, in the longer written version of this analysis, I talk about one of the most beautiful train reveries ever, the one in Edward Thomas's Adelstrop. In that poem, because I think the train window must have been open, the railroad reverie meets Ode to a Nightingale. The blackbird that sings enchantingly and all the birds of Oxfordshire and Gloucestershire are not inside the train. They're outside, but their song is audible through the open window and permeates the coach, so there's no barrier there between exterior and interior. And in the written version of this, I also talk about the American poet Saskia Hamilton's poem Flatlands, in which she describes the passing view from a train in the window. And then she says, and I think this is, should be your final quotation. Um, she's on the train and she says, let this be non-thought, one thought to oneself, non-thoughts of passengers on the way forward. That non-thought is precisely what I've been suggesting is the chief characteristic of the reverie produced by the train a different way of knowing, a partial and mediated perception. So the poetic topos I've discussed is not uniquely contemporary because Thomas wrote his poem in 1914 and Saskia Hamilton is Dutch-American and Edward Thomas is Anglo-Welsh, so the topos isn't uniquely Irish either. It's European, it's also American, and it may appear in any country of the world that has trains. And the trains in these Irish poems run all over the place, through Poland, England, Italy, Slovakia, Galway, Skerries, and an unnamed territory. There may be, and I think there probably are, topoi that are unique to contemporary Irish poetry, but this isn't one of them. Uh, the train reverie offers one way of showing how contemporary Irish poems may exist in traditions that are ancient and European. Thank you. That's it. Thank you.